Let's talk a little bit now about how ethanol is poisonous to the liver. And um, I want to be mindful of the word poison because it's uh, it's a it's a it's a controversial word. People get all bent out of shape. Um, so feel feel free to use whatever word you want. I mean, I, I sort of think the dose makes the poison. Everything is technically a poison, right? Tylenol is clearly a poison. Whereas a low dose of Tylenol is a wonderful thing if you've got a splitting headache or a fever. Um, but at some point, you exceed the capacity of the liver to metabolize it, and it goes from being um, not harmful to deadly. So, you know, clearly that applies to everything out there, including oxygen. So let's put the nomenclature aside. What is it about the metabolism of ethanol that is problematic for the liver? So again, let's let's go back to our friend, the hepatocyte, and you have uh, ethanol or alcohol that starts to get processed. So how do we how how does the normal liver cell process this? Alcohol dehydrogenase. You're going from alcohol to um, acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is then metabolized further, and it eventually becomes you know carbon dioxide, water, ordinarily you know a uh, type of moieties, right? Um, but where you start to see problems is some of the redox potential when, when the capacity, and again, these are very variable. If you look at populations, um, how alcohol is handled in various populations, and even just the dimorphic differences in, in sex between men and women, um, how livers metabolize alcohol, um, that normal process can be overwhelmed. And then all of a sudden you start to have um, peroxidation. And that's a, a feature that we see in the non-alcoholic or the, the metabolic dysfunction that's not associated with alcohol-related liver disease. Um, there's, you know, the, the, that's about 80% of the alcohol metabolism. There's another pathway that's also invoked. Um, but what we're talking about when there's, when there is um, alterations and injury and toxicity, that's when you have uh, the acetaldehyde behaving badly. And so it's behaving kind of like you're describing as, as a toxin, it's attracting, um, uh, free radicals. It is attracting uh, immune cells. It is attract. It is um, leading to fat deposition, altered metabolism at the level of the cell, and so that's um, some of the commonalities. Different different enzymes are being used, um, but that's some of the commonalities when we look histologically. Uh, at somebody who's not using alcohol versus someone who is, um, there are some features that you cannot distinguish um, histologically because the injury pattern is so similar. I'm not sure if that's answering your question or not. It answers it, but of course poses many more. So let's unpack that a bit. Um, again, I'll just try to translate it a little bit so that I make sure I'm understanding it. But when we talk about the metabolism of ethanol, um, we have this enzyme, alcohol dehydrogenase. Of course, we know as some some people genetically are lacking in that enzyme or don't have a, as effective a version of it. These people tend to be incredibly sensitive to alcohol. They get beet red when they drink it. Um, and in some regards, I guess they're largely protected from the toxicity of alcohol because they simply can't tolerate it. Um, but for most people, you go ahead and you metabolize it. And while the downstream stuff is ultimately the same as the normal carbohydrates, basically CO2 and water, you get acetaldehyde as an intermediary. And um, I guess my question for you is, why, why, do, why is acetaldehyde toxic as an intermediary? Does it stick around long enough to cause problems? Like, why isn't it all just being flushed to CO2 and water quickly? It's sort of like saying, when we metabolize carbohydrates, we when we metabolize glucose, we stock at pyruvate before we go to acetyl CoA and CO two and water. Um, you know, you wouldn't think of pyruvate being problematic unless it's stuck around for a really long time. So, yeah, help, help me understand why it is that is it just any minor exposure to it is problematic, even if it's very brief. It'd be hard to say unless you had a system-wide, pretty diverse cohort to be able to say, you know, where is the system overwhelmed? But what we can say that it it, it does attract um, inflammatory cells. So there's something about it at a certain level to be determined um, that attracts, um, I, I kind of an analogize it to the lipotoxicity model in, in my favorite disease, metabolic dysfunction associated disease. There's something about 
that moiety that makes it um, pro-inflammatory mm. and how the body, how an individual and how that liver will handle the inflammation that's a resultant of the acetaldehyde attracting um, free radicals and um, overwhelming the redox potential of that cell is one uh, mechanism by which injury is occurring. Know that you know not every cell is going to behave similarly. And so the relative injury of some cells versus others, um, the compensatory damage and recruitment of um, inflammatory handlers, you know, whether it's monocytes, macrophages, or lymphocytes, um, is also going to play a role. So we're starting to get at some of the complexities that are extremely hard to tease out um, unless you're thinking not just molecularly, but at the liver as the liver as a whole. You also mentioned that there are besides the obvious genetic difference I gave, people with and without alcohol dehydrogenase uh, polymorphisms. You also mentioned that there are sex differences. Um, I wrote about this somewhat recently. Uh, maybe you could say a little bit more about the differences between men and women in this regard. And then within sexes, I'm also curious to hear about how much um, heterogeneity there is in the both the capacity to metabolize ethanol and of course the susceptibility to its toxicity. You know, the old studies, and this is why, you know, alcohol has been studied longer than any of the viral hepatitides. Um, a lot of the sex differences were just attributed to the fact that alcohol is a polar compound. And so it's less soluble in fat and women uh, body composition wise typically have more fat. And so the relative um, damage that could be done um, was based on body composition. I don't, I don't know that that's necessarily true, um, but it was, an, it was an easy way to sort of explain some of the early differences at that point. Um, so when it comes to gene expression, uh, again, you're going to have to look specifically at premenopausal women versus postmenopausal women, um, and not just androgen components and estrogen components, but also the upstream signaling of all of these as, as far as I know, and I'm not an alcohol expert, none of those have been teased apart in terms mm. of sex differences specific to the premenopausal woman um, handling of um, let's, you know, it's 14 grams, you know, no matter what the alcohol component is, it's approximately 14 grams that we see. So how that liver and subcutaneous fat component and hormonal responses to the compound, um, acetaldehyde generation, or other potential toxic moieties. Um, those are all variables to be studied. 